had to turn my mic on. It's great to have you guys. Uh, if you're looking for a service that's not as full, the 1130 has plenty of room. Uh, we'd love for you to jump over and join us there. Um, but it's great to have you guys with us. If this is your first time, uh, my name is Pastor Chris, and just excited that you are here. If you want to know what the church is about, we just sang about it. Um, Crosswinds Church is about bringing honor and glory to Jesus Christ who has done everything and paid the ultimate price for us. And we want him to be magnified and glorified in everything that we do and say. Um, one of the things that um, I typically strive to do before I step up here is to um, kneel before the Lord. And it's really interesting because I was, I was just praying before I walked up here. And I typically pray in a way that, Lord, um, Lord, would you just use my words? And I realized that God just kind of maybe corrected me. And, and I began to pray and ask the Lord for him just to give me his words. So that this morning you would actually hear him and not me. And so that's the prayer this morning. It's the one thing that I think we desire as a church and as uh, leaders of Jesus Church. Uh, this is his church. This is not my church. Um, he's just put me in this place to lead it for this time um, and this place. And I just trust him to do what only he can do. I believe that this morning, whether it's your first time or you've been coming for uh, the 15 years that we've been here. By the way, is there anybody who's been here like all 15 years? Yeah, tiny. Is that it? Man, I've run some people off, y'all. Uh, eight? Okay. Uh, one, how many, I can't count. Five, six, seven, right? All right, ten? Ten. All right, ten. Thirteen. Okay. How about like two months? <laughs> but it's, it's, great to, it's great to have you guys. Um, I probably should be preaching to those who've been here longer uh, this morning. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Love you guys. Um, but we, we are in a, a series called uh, I Am a Disciple, and this morning we're going to be looking at um, this whole idea of where Jesus said, come, take up your cross, and follow me from Mark chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, you want to turn there. Um, we, uh, this is what we uh, call a vision series, where over the last few weeks we've been talking about the vision of the church, and the vision of the church is this, or really the mission of the church is to um, preach the word, to make disciples, and to care for others. And the calling and the responsibility of the church right, of the church is not to just gather people and make them feel good and make them feel comfortable and, um, you know, pat them on the back and say good job, but it's actually to help people become, uh, understand what it means to actually be more like Jesus. Um, and, and so when we say preach the word, uh, that as a part of the mission, that mission has been given to all of us who claim to be followers of Jesus, who have said yes to Jesus at some point in our life, your responsibility is to preach the word of God. You're like, well, I can't get up there and preach. That's right. You're not expected to get up here and preach. Most of you would suck if you got up here and preached. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said that word, but, um, uh, but the calling is to go into the places that God has given you and take the word of God and you have God gives you the ability to impart it into your home and into your workplace and into those marketplaces where you might find yourself at. And so then make disciples, that's the calling of the church, but it's also the calling of those of us who claim to be followers of Jesus, that it becomes our responsibility. The one, listen, the one way that Jesus gave the church to reach the world was to make disciples. Okay, so the, so the responsibility in that is that as the church, as we are becoming more like Jesus, then what we are doing is we're connecting with more people who we know need Jesus. And hopefully in turn, seeing them understand and become a part of the family of God by saying yes to Jesus, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. 
You see, Jesus came to his disciples. When Jesus came on, came on the scene, uh, he came to a few of his disciples and he said, hey, I want you to come and follow me. A few of them were fishing. One of them was a tax collector. They were all kind of doing different things. Jesus said, came to them. He said, hey, I want you to come and follow me. What we know to be true is that the only, point, the only thing that they had seen up into this point is that they had seen Jesus do some, uh, just a few miracles, but they had also see, seen and heard his teaching and they knew that his teaching was much different than John the Baptist or anyone else. And when they saw the authority at which Jesus taught, they made the decision that they were willing to drop everything and immediately follow Jesus. And so that's what it means to actually be a disciple. And we've been asking that question over these last couple of weeks. Are you a disciple? Can you say that I am a disciple of Jesus? And let me just say this, a disciple of Jesus is very different than a cultural Christian. Okay, now there are a lot of people in our society these days that call themselves Christians, right? And so what we've done is, as a culture, we've taken that term and the culture has actually very much twisted that term into being something that it was never actually intended to be. Christianity and being a Christ follower means that I am following Jesus and it means I'm striving to be like Jesus. But what has happened in our culture and in our society is that we've taken the term Christian, we've made it cultural, we've made it into what we want it to be, and the reality of it is that most Christians nowadays by statistics don't even go to church. They claim to be Jesus, they claim to be Christians, but they very rarely ever go to church. They very rarely ever read their Bible. They very rarely ever pray, and they very rarely ever actually give a portion of their income back to Jesus. Most people who claim to be Christians, they say in the church, only about 2% people actually tithe back to the church. And do you realize that as much as we're called, and this is not a, it's okay, this is not a, this is not a message on tithing, okay? As much as we are called to be in relationship and walk with Jesus and spend time in his word and spend time talking to him, it's also a responsibility of ours to give back a portion of what God's given to us. It's not yours anyway. And guess what? At any moment, Jesus can take it away because it's not yours either. And so, understanding that, and that's what this whole disciple thing is really all about. See, the American dream is what we have, our culture, I'm not saying you, but maybe, what we have bought into as a culture is this whole idea of the American dream. I heard that term quite a bit this past week. The American dream, right? What is the American dream? To have a, to have a, a easy life, to build yourself a life that is comfortable, it's convenient, it, it, has, it has money, it has cars, it has houses, because if we're wanting to buy into the American dream, it's really all about accumulation of stuff that in reality actually doesn't even make us happy. Because the American dream is all about accumulate, accumulate more, more, more. That's the culture. And the, the, the sad part is, is that a lot of times when we get what we want, we actually want more. And then you get there and then you realize you want more and you want more. And the question becomes, when does it stop? I'm just not, there's nothing wrong with having things. If you got a nice house and you got a nice income and you got a nice car and all those kind of things, that's great. But God has called us to steward the things that we've been given. Because again, at any moment, it can be stripped away from you. And if that moment comes where it was stripped away from you, would you still love and serve Jesus? Come on now. Or is your heart become tied to these things? That's the very reason in the Sermon on the Mount, which I asked you to read last week, it's the very reason where Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, for wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we've, we've bought into this idea of the American dream. We, and it's, it's constantly flashing in front of us. Words like, you need this. You deserve this. Hot and now, 
Hot now. It ain't hot now. Come on now. Hot now. You know, you can have it right your way. Right away. Are you, anybody go to Burger King? Come on now. Right? You worked hard for it. I hate these words. You're entitled to it. You ain't entitled to Jack. You're not entitled to Jack. And so, so we begin to understand and what, what the whole point that I'm trying to make this morning is all about discipleship is there's something very different. Jesus often took the things that we thought were culturally even, even religiously correct and he actually flipped them upside down. He actually flipped them upside down. And we're actually going to see that this morning. Proverbs chapter, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, it says this. It says, in their hearts, humans plan their course, right? There's nothing wrong with planning. There's nothing wrong with planning your 401k or planning to have retirement or planning to build a house or planning for a car or planning for your kid's education or planning for, for, for things in life. But the reality at the core of it, at the core of it, it doesn't matter what you plan if your purpose is to do and be the very thing that God has called you to. At the core, and we talked a little bit about that last week in your priorities. I love this. In the words of the great theologian Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they get, <laughs> hold on, let me finish it. <laughs> right, you guys didn't even let me finish the sentence. <laughs> in the words of the great theologian Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> right? And then reality kind of sets in. I had the dream of being a professional basketball player. I mean, have you looked at me? Right? I, I, I played basketball in, in middle school. I actually started from a very young age of loving basketball. I grew up liking, loving Michael Jordan, saw him play in college, saw him go to the pros and thought at the age of 10, I can do that, right? I can be like, I can be like Mike, right? And got into high school, I mean, got into middle school and was pretty decent middle school, went into high school and played ball in a, in a, in a small high school back in High Point, North Carolina, and was fairly successful at it. And I thought, man, I'm just, I'm just, I got it, right? And, but my senior year came and not one recruit, not one. I'm like, uh, you know, I think I'm too white, too short, <laughs> and too slow, and really not all that good, right? And so, it's really interesting because I, I played soccer in high school, and I played basketball, but I got recruited for soccer, which I didn't want to play. <laughs> and so, I went into college, played a year of college soccer, my one year into it, had the college basketball, had the coach from the, from the uh, college come to me and say, hey, you want to come try out for the team? He saw me play in intramurals. I did pretty good in intramurals, which I don't know why that was, he compared the two, but he did ask me to come try out for the team. I made the team. Yeah. I was one of two white guys. The other guy was 6'8", and I was 5'9". And guess when I got on the floor? We were either up by 30 or we were down by 30. But see, I thought going into college and him asking me to come play, this is my big break, right? This is my step into the NBA. And it got squashed pretty quickly, right? It's all fun and games so you get punched in the face, right? But it's American dream. But I believe that what Jesus has invited us into, it's not the American dream. It's nothing like the American dream. It has nothing to do with the American dream. It's totally opposite of the American dream, and not that those things are bad, but it's totally different. What Jesus has invited us to and what he has called us to is even so much greater than anything that we could ever imagine or experience. You see, we talked, we talked last two weeks ago about a disciple first says yes to Jesus. That Jesus came to his disciples and he said, come and follow me. And they dropped everything. They pretty much with their lives, maybe not even with their mouths, but with their lives, they, they left everything that they were doing. He said, now you will no longer fish for men or fish for fish. I'm actually going to teach you to fish for men. 
And they said yes to Jesus. And then last week we, we realized that as a disciple of Jesus, these guys left everything that they were doing and now they began to walk with Jesus. The reality of it is, is that Jesus has invited us and he's called us all into following him, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he's calling you out of the profession that you're in right now. I, I, I don't believe that if you're saying yes to Jesus that you go home tomorrow and fill out your, fill out your um, resignation or call your boss and say, yo, I said yes, yes to Jesus, I'm out. That's probably not your best, that's probably not your best step, unless that's what Jesus tells you between now and then, because it's quite possible. And then last week we talked about a disciple, if I'm saying that I am a disciple, then a disciple actually walks with Jesus. It's very different than the cultural Christian who said very, very rarely ever goes to church and very rarely ever gets in their Bible and very rarely ever actually stops to pray or is in community with other, other believers. This is a calling to literally walk with Jesus. And how do we do that nowadays is we actually take time, we make it a priority to to spend time with Jesus. You see, a disciple is someone, this is the definition that we've been giving you guys, a disciple is someone who is a committed follower of Jesus, who seeks to grow in faith, emulates his teaching, and actively shares the gospel with others. So if you're asking yourself today, am I a disciple of Jesus, then are those things answering that question for you? Do you see those things in your life? Because listen, there are a lot of good churches in the world today. There are a lot of good churches in the world, and I believe that maybe probably one of the missing parts of that is that there are too many churches who are just interested in gathering a bunch of people, but not actually doing the mission that Jesus called us to in making disciples. Because it's easy to be a religious person, and to be honest with you, Jesus squashed religi religiosity. Is that a word? I made it up. I'm like Mike Tyson, I'm a theologian. <laughs> and so let's take a moment and let's look at Matt, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 has some verses that we, I think, are going to challenge us this morning. And if you're here and you're still just trying to figure things out spiritually, um, I want you to know that I think this is a good place to begin to um, work that piece of it out in your life. Maybe you got asked to come here by a friend or a family member and you're just trying to still figure things out spiritually. I know at times we've had people who drive by and they, they say, man, I just, for whatever reason, I was told to turn around and come back. And they sat in here and in the course of time, they ended up giving their life to Christ. And so I know that that kind of thing still happens. And so if you're here this morning and God is trying to get your attention spiritually, um, what I believe he's going to do today is he's going to probably take your cultural Christianity or even what it means to be a disciple and he's going to flip it upside down and make you realize that there's so much more to this life than maybe even what we've experienced to this point. Mark chapter 8 uh, in verse 34 says this, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. So Jesus, if, you, if you backtrack a little bit into Matthew chapter 8, Jesus has just fed the 4,000, he's fed 4,000 people. He has healed a blind man in Bethesda, uh, in Bethsaida by spitting onto the guy's eyes, rubbing mud onto his eyes and sending the guy to wash his eyes and he receives sight. He has declared that he is the Messiah He's even asked Peter that. Who, who do people say that I am? In, in Mark 8 and uh, verse 27, uh, Jesus goes through predicting his own death. Um, and then uh, this section, which we're going to look at this morning, is called the way of the cross, uh, according to the NIV section. And Jesus said this, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must what? Deny must deny themselves and take, take up their cross and follow me. If we want to be 
a disciple of Jesus. If we want to be more than just a cultural Christian, if we want to fulfill the very purpose that which we've been created for and do the very thing that Jesus has actually in his word has actually called us to, then what we have to understand is that as a follower of Jesus, we have to deny ourselves, we have to take up our cross, and we have to follow him. For whoever wants to save their life will what? So whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for for me and for the gospel will actually save it. And so what essentially what he's saying is that if we want to find true life, I believe there are a lot of people in our society nowadays, they're looking for what life is truly all about. And the sad part is, is that most people are running after that American dream, this accumulation mentality that if I can just get this, if I just get that, then that'll be the thing that'll make me settled. It'll make me feel like I've been given purpose, power, positions, money, accumulations. Those are things. If I just have those things, then I'll be happy. And the reality of it is, is that they run after those things and they run after those things and they come to the end of their life and realize that they've just actually lost everything because they ran after the wrong things. And so Jesus begins to help us understand what is it actually, what is true life? This is that moment where Jesus says, it's true life is found in the denial of yourself. It's found in the taking up of your cross. It's found in the following him. This is that transformational moment, all right? It's that transformational moment that he's challenging his disciples and saying, hey guys, you're no longer, you can no longer play in the kiddie pool. The kiddie pool is no longer. You've got to get out of the kiddie pool and you've got to jump into the deep end. You can, you, can, you can go through all of your religious systems and your religious rituals, and we know that to be true because Jesus taught us that last week as he was telling his disciples. He said, hey guys, you can say, Lord, Lord, all you want. You can cast out demons. You can heal the blind. You can heal the sick. But at the end of the day, when you stand before me, if you didn't know me, if you didn't walk in relationship with me, then what I'll say to you is away from me because I never knew you. And so it's so much deeper than just showing up for Sunday and going through the motions. It's so much deeper than that. He's asking us, and the sad part is, I believe as the church, the church in general, we've made it easy for people. We've, we've, we've not wanted to offend people. And I don't know if you know Jesus, but Jesus was pretty offensive. He was willing to say the hard things to people when they needed to be said to people, right? The woman at the well. Jesus encounters this woman at the well, and he, he asked the woman for a drink, and it was in the middle of the day, and Samaritans didn't talk to Jews, and in that moment, and men didn't talk to women, and those kind of things. And Jesus said, hey, why don't you go get your husband? Guess what? He, she said, I don't have one. And Jesus said, you're right. You have five, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. Can you imagine? Most of us would be f- offended. That's what happens in church. When accountability or responsibility is questioned, then most of the time what happens is we get hurt, and we do what? We leave. And Jesus did it all the time. Probably every single one of us in here at some point have gotten hurt by someone in the church, right? There's probably a good portion of you. And Jesus was offensive. But this was that transformational moment where Jesus said to his disciples, okay, hey guys, come and follow me. They said, okay. They they put their nets aside, they put their boats on the shore, and they followed Jesus. They took their tax collecting table, and they put it to the side, and they stopped doing that, and they, followed, they began to follow Jesus, okay? They began to walk with Jesus, and I, I mean, I can only imagine, I think, but this is that moment 
where all of a sudden now Jesus is asking us for so much more. He's asking us for more than what we think we can even give. And we have to trust him in that moment that yes, we've said yes, and yes, we've left everything behind, and yes, we've been walking with you, and yes, you've been teaching us, but all of a sudden now Jesus says, oh, guess what? You have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross. You have to follow me. When's the last time you actually denied yourself? We see, we live in a culture where this is Amazon culture. This is hot now. This is get it when you want it, right? You just go on your little Amazon account and you just order it, right? You, you, oh, you're hungry, right? You just call them right up. DoorDash, be here in 20 minutes, right? Well, I, I was, we got done with dinner the other night, and I'm like, you know what? I want a Frosty. I said, Ashley, you want a Frosty? She's like, yeah. I was like, I'm going to get a Frosty. I didn't deny myself nothing. I like Frosties. I'm an ice cream guy. Until I go to the doctor and realize my cholesterol's high. And I better start denying myself something. But all of a sudden, Jesus said, deny yourself. He said, take up your cross. Can you imagine? Okay, imagine with me for just a moment the disciples and what they're thinking. Jesus used this term because the disciples in that moment fully understood what Jesus was saying because it was a cultural thing. We don't understand it these days. We, don't, we, we can't grasp it. But can you imagine the disciples in that moment? They lived as a part, they were also a part of the Roman culture. And what would happen in the Roman culture is when you were accused of something, they actually made you go carry your own cross and carry it to the execution site and lay it down. Then they would take you and put you on that cross, nail you to the cross, and hang you up. So what Jesus said in that moment was so much deeper than what we can fathom and even begin to understand because we can't wrap our mind around the fact that Jesus has actually called us to die. He's called us to die. And can you imagine being the disciples in that moment thinking, oh man, I might actually die. And the reality of it is the majority of disciples actually died for their faith. They were, they were executed, and many, most all of them died horrible deaths because what he was saying to them is, this is how far you have to be willing to go if you're going to follow me. And what we have to do in our society these days is we have to figure out how does that translate and what is it that Jesus is asking me do, to do if I'm going to take up my cross and follow him. Because you most likely will never be, hopefully, not accused of anything. You most likely will be never come to the point where if you say, I serve Jesus or I follow Jesus or I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that because of my faith in Jesus, it's probably not going to happen that you're actually going to get killed in this generation for that. Do you understand what I'm saying? And in America, because we're just not there. I will say that I believe that there will come a time where there'll be a generation of younger people who are growing up that they'll be challenged and if they don't say and do the right thing, they will actually be put in prison. I believe the time's coming. I think it's closer than what we think it is. But this was that transformational moment where all of a sudden now it went to a whole nother level and Jesus said true life is found in following me and this is where it starts to get really hard. I believe in the church we've made it too easy at times. Oh, if you just come to church, if you just say yes to Jesus, if you just do this and you just do that, you just show up and if you just give a little bit of money and if you just pray a little bit and if you just read your Bible, if you just do all these things, then Jesus will love you and it'll all be good. And the reality of it is, is when Jesus called his disciples, it was actually the very opposite in that he said, hey, walk with me and realize that life is going to be hard. And guess what? That in life being hard, you're going to find the most complete joy that you've ever had. So if you're struggling with joy this morning, maybe it's because you've actually been running after the wrong things. 
And maybe actually because of how hard life may be right now, God's trying to get your attention and help you realize that what you have put your faith in is maybe just not really life at all. I believe that God allows us to walk through those difficult times to help us see him more. And it's not always because of our stupidity. Sometimes I think God allows our consequences to be as a result of our stupidity, right? Right? Have you ever parented, (laughs) right? You say, hey, you probably shouldn't do that. They go out and do it. There's consequences to it. There's consequences because of your stupidity, not because of my authority. So true life is found in following Jesus. Man, I got to hurry. Second thing is, is that true life is found when we deny, when we die to self, right? Jesus said, deny yourself when we die to self. We die daily because we believe there is joy. We decide to die daily because we believe that there's joy on the other side of the cross, life on the other side of this tomb that we're living in. One, one uh, guy, one commentary wrote, to die daily is just another way of saying, Lord, help me see the opportunities to follow you in front of me. And when we come to Christ, he gives us a new identity. And then Jesus begins to work on the rest of us. That's what I love about Jesus, right? It's too often we thought, oh, well, I got to clean myself up to come to Jesus. The great thing is Jesus just says, come to me and then I'll begin to work on you. I'll begin to do the work in you and on you. But Jesus calls us to crucify, to put to death our own plans, our own desires, It's where we stop trying to gratify the flesh. Jesus further calls us to face the potential loss of family and friends and reputation and material goods and career and personal dreams and following him. It's taking the American dream and saying, that's actually not what I want. What I actually want is I want to fulfill the purpose in which God created me for. I want to walk in that purpose. And the great thing is, is that if you're here today and you're living in retirement and you've screwed up the first part of your life, God can actually use the last half of your life or whatever days that there are left. If you're young here, don't screw up the rest. Make, it a, make the decision now to say, that's what I want. I don't want the American dream. I want what Jesus has for me. And if Paul talked about there were times in life where he had plenty, but there were also times in life where he didn't have much of anything. And so we just realized that that's part of life. But Jesus is trying to help us understand that is so much deeper than probably what we've experienced at this point, that true life is found when we die to self. When was the last time we actually denied ourselves anything? True life is found. Second thing is, Jesus said, you must deny yourself, take up your cross. That true life is found in surrender. You see, because the culture is totally different. The culture says you put yourself in a place of power, position, that money, cash is king. And that you do everything you possibly can to put yourself in in that position. And what Jesus did was he actually took that, he flipped it upside down. And I believe it's more of an attitude of hands out, hands up. And saying, God, whatever it is that you have for me, that's what I want to do. It's in, it's in surrendering. It's this surrendering of my comfort and my conveniences for the purpose and the mission that God has on my life. And my question is, are you willing, what are you willing to give up in a culture that says that you can have everything? Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The last thing is this, is that true life is found when we walk in obedience. Obedience is a process of becoming a servant to the things that God has actually called you to.
and that he is calling you to. You may be sitting there saying, well, I don't know what that is, but if you'll walk with him, if you'll deny yourself, if you'll surrender, then what God will do is he will show you what obedience looks like moving forward, and he will make those things clear. Hey, um, worship team, you guys can go ahead and come on out. It's a process of becoming obedient to the things that God calls, to being a servant how far are you willing to go even when it doesn't make sense? And I've remind, I've been, I'm, I'm constantly reminded of this. We, can you imagine being one of the disciples? There's in the scripture, there's a time where Jesus feeds 5,000 people, right? He's teaching the, this whole group of people, this 5,000, they get hangry. They get very hangry in that moment. That term didn't exist then, but we made it up. They get very hungry and G the disciples come to Jesus. He says, man, these people are getting rowdy. They're getting hungry. Let's send them away back into the town to find something to eat. And what did Jesus say to them? No, he said, you give them something to eat. And they were like, what? What do you mean us give them something to eat? We don't even have anything. And they go steal this little boy's lunch his five loaves and his two fish, and they break it back and they say, Jesus, uh, we just ripped this little kid off, but this is all we got. <laughs> and he's like, okay. And Jesus prayed over it and he multiplied it, right? But listen, when he multiplied it, he only multiplied it into five baskets. There were 5,000 people. You think five baskets feed 5,000 people? I always picture myself in that situation where I'm one of the 12 disciples and I'm standing here holding, holding my basket and Jesus has the little bag and he prays over it and all of a sudden he starts taking his little bag and he starts filling the baskets up with it, right? And we're like, wow, that's awesome. He's, he's filling my basket up with just the bag with just these five loaves, these two fish, and then he's going to the next basket, and he's going to the next basket, next basket, and he's filling them all up. But then you're, you're one of the disciples, and now Jesus says, now you feed them. You're like, uh, um, I, I only got some basket, Jesus. And then all of a sudden, you step out, and you're like, okay, well, I guess if this looks bad, it looks bad on Jesus, not me. And you start going around to each individual, and they start taking from it. And you get to like person like 15 and person 25 and person 50 and now you're up to person 75 and you realize that your basket is not even getting any lower. You get to like person 100 or person 250. You get, you're getting to like, you might even get to where you've already fed like a thousand people and you still got food in your basket. Because what Jesus does is he takes our obedience and what we think is going to happen. We're like, Jesus, this doesn't make sense. It's not going to work. And what happens is, is when we step out in obedience, then all of a sudden God does his part. And so a disciple walks in obedience. True life is found when a disciple walks in obedience. Look at Mark 3 real quick. Mark 3 says this. Jesus closes this section out with these three verses. And I find it really interesting, right? He says, okay, guys, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Whoever loses his life will find it and whoever finds their life will lose it. And then he says this. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their own soul? He said, or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be what? You, you want to talk about all of a sudden getting real. You thought that when Jesus said, oh, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me, that you got it pretty real. But now he says, you know what? You can, you can live the American dream. You can accumulate all these things. But you realize that when you do that, you've actually lost your life. They're actually not really important. You actually lost your very soul. Because what happens is your soul became, those things became the priority of your soul and they became the things that you were chasing after in your soul and in your heart. And Jesus says, now because you have denied me that when you stand before the Father, he says, he'll say, sorry, I didn't know this person. And that puts it into reality. And if we want to jump out of the kiddie pool this morning, we have to jump into, there's, 
There is a process, but I don't believe there's a kiddie pool to the um, middle school pool. I believe it's a kiddie pool to the adult pool. It's a, it's a jumping. It's this reality that, hey, I'm, I'm surrendering my comfort and my conveniences because I want to truly follow Jesus and not worried about what the world around me says, what the world's running after. I want to run after Jesus. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. And to do that, I'm willing to get out of the, the, the kiddie pool and I'm willing to dive into the adult pool. And that's the calling. It's not just this comfortable come and go through the motions. It's this denying yourself. It's this taking up your cross. And it's following Jesus. And one of the reasons why we know that Jesus called us to this is because of the sacrifice that he made on the cross. Isn't it interesting that the very thing that Jesus called us to, he did himself. He denied himself as the son of God. God sent Jesus to this earth as a man. He denied himself He carried his cross and he died for you and for me in obedience to the will of the Father. And he's asking and inviting and calling us into the exact same thing. Not something that he didn't already do. So you have a communion thing at your seat and just we're going to take communion communion is designed for those who have given their life to Christ if you said yes to Jesus you said Jesus at some point in your life you said yes to Jesus and you want to follow him or today you're making the commitment that Jesus I've just been going through the motions to this point or I haven't even known what a relationship with it is and today I'm going to start to figure out what that means you can take you can participate in communion by today just saying yes to Jesus but if you are unsure you're not really sure that's the step you want to take then my encouragement to you is to not take communion because because Paul was pretty clear to the church in Corinth that when we take communion unadvisedly, we actually actually cast judgment on ourselves. So Jesus had this moment in the upper room with his disciples where he was telling them that he was going to be leaving. He was going to be leaving this mission in the hands of the disciples to take the message of Jesus to the rest of the world. And he wanted them to have something to come back to, to build a foundation on. And he said, when you do this, you remember what I've done for you. When you get into those difficult situations and those hard times, you remember that I endured the cross for you. And they ate that meal together. And in the middle of that meal, Jesus took out a piece of bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread, it represents my body broken for you. And when you eat this, you do it in remembering what I have done for you. If you want to take that piece of wafer out, this signifies Jesus' body this morning for us that was broken and bruised for us. Will you close your eyes for just a second and just say, God, would you purify my heart so that when I take this, my heart's in the right place. I'm realizing that you died on the cross for me and I want to continue to do everything I possibly can to serve you, to love you and be more like you. Thank you. And this morning we remember your cross, Jesus. And Jesus said, take and eat in remembrance. And then Jesus took the cup and he passed the cup around. 
And he said, this cup, it represents my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Can you imagine being the disciples after this meal in just a few short days, seeing Jesus and seeing the nails driven into his hands and feet and blood being poured out of his hands and feet, a crown of thorns being shoved on his head and blood and water flowing, blood coming down his face from that crown of thorns. and agonizing for a few hours as he died for you and for me. We can't just go through the motions, our rituals in church. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross, for shedding your blood. And as we partake of this juice this morning, would you help us? to remember the sacrifice that you made. Thank you, Jesus. You may partake. Would you stand with me? Lord, if you would just help us to end this time trusting in your presence and magnifying you and remembering you and even saying to you, Jesus, that we want to follow you at whatever it takes. We want to say yes to you. We're going to sing a song. If you want to come down front, make this kind of a declaration this morning, you're more than willing to do that. Make it a time of prayer. Make it a time of worship. We want to give you that as an opportunity as we sing this last song.